Welcome to Mark My Words. I'm Mark Evans. In the world of trash talk and MTV, celebrity is often bestowed upon those who are merely famous, not accomplished. We forget that words and music have become shrill, coarse, and strident, and that words and music can enlighten, instruct, and inspire. The subject of this episode of Mark My Words is someone whose music did all those things and more. We'll be talking about the amazing life and work of Bernard Herrmann. And we'll do that right after this message. Many years ago, the Hungarian composer Béla Bartók went to France. He consulted Isidor Philippe, the most celebrated piano pedagogue in Europe, and Philippe offered to introduce him to the most distinguished composers in France, Camille Saint-Saëns, Charles-Marie Widor, but Bartók only wanted to meet Claude Debussy. You don't want to meet Debussy, Philippe said. He's a hard man. He's rude and insulting. You don't want to be insulted by Debussy, do you? Yes, said Bartok. Bartok would have understood how I felt about Bernard Herrmann. Speaking about one's idols is a hazardous affair at best. One must avoid blind hero worship. But when the musical hero is enigmatic, contradictory, and an iconoclast, the challenge is to dwell upon the towering achievement of his work, not an abundance of anecdotes about his remarkable personality. I've often wondered, with all the available musical idols I could have chosen, why did I select one of the most difficult and demanding musicians ever to ascend the podium? The answer, of course, is simple. You do not choose idols. They choose you by virtue of their unique capabilities and the talents with which they are endowed. Bernard Herrmann was a legend among friends and foes alike for his desire to defend his musical integrity. He had an irascible disposition and a volcanic temperament at times. He would express his opinions on all subjects at the top of his lungs. He said what he thought, and if you didn't agree with him, that would be your problem. His friend, the composer David Raxon, who introduced us, told me, Benny Herman's basic mood is a towering rage, and he builds up from there. And Oscar Levant, hardly a soul of tact and diplomacy himself, and a friend of Bernard Herman's called him America's ambassador of ill will. His wife, Norma, took me aside one day and said, Mark, Benny always talks to you as if you're about seven. The other night, we met Elmer Bernstein at a party, and Benny talked to him as if he were five. Elmer Bernstein told me he idolized Bernard Herrmann. In the early years of his career, he was amazed to find that the music department of 20th Century Fox called him and told him he was going to be assigned to score a film called The View from Pompey's Head a plum assignment for the young composer on the recommendation of Bernard Herrmann, who couldn't do it because of a deadline. He called Mr. Herrmann to express his appreciation. 
Let me explain this, said Bernard Herrmann on the phone. I recommended you because you're a talented young man and the right composer for the job. This in no way implies that I'm personally interested in your career or that I like you. And he hung up. And then, on one occasion, the composer Paul Hindemith was praised by a fan for writing Mathister Mahler. Hindemith shrugged his shoulders and said, that was just a work of my youth. Mr. Herman turned around and looked at Hindemith and said, the trouble with you is you grew up too soon. And then there was that episode at CBS when Mr. Herman called out to a clarinetist in the orchestra, whoever told you you could play the clarinet? The clarinetist shot back, whoever told you you could conduct? Two great musicians. The clarinetist's name was Benny Goodman. The first time I ever spoke to Mr. Herman, he called me on the phone to inform me that he was not going to ask me to come to see him. He said this was because I knew nothing about film music. He didn't know anything about me or my background or who I was, but he said most people don't know anything about film music these days. Why should I assume you're different than anyone else? Happily, he changed his mind. I did go to see him, and I discovered he was a genius. The genuine article, not a fake, phony, over-promoted, and under-talented product of a good press agent. I also learned, contrary to what anyone might imagine, he took a great interest in young composers. While other composers in the film music world joined committees and joined organizations and promoted themselves as the champions of young composers, Mr. Herman did what he did privately, without fanfare. He asked me to bring my music to come see him, and I did. I brought him scores, trembling, but I did. He once even rewrote four bars of a piece that I'd written. I've never forgotten it. He began his career studying, of course, at the Juilliard School of Music, but his big influence was the somewhat eccentric and dazzling Australian pianist and composer Percy Granger. Even as a young man, Bernard Herrmann developed an encyclopedic knowledge of obscure music and English literature. At a very young age, he started his own orchestra, the New Chamber Orchestra of New York. And when at the scoring radio, he did 1,200 programs, was associated with Orson Welles on the Mercury Theater of the Air, and of course did the music for the famous War of the Worlds broadcast. And Wells liked him so much and respected him that when Wells went to Hollywood to do Citizen Kane, Bernard Herrmann came along, did the score, wrote an incredible operatic aria for that picture to be sung deliberately off-key by a soprano as part of the dramatic action. And there was the Magnificent Ambersons, and the Devil and Daniel Webster, for which he won his only Oscar, and Jane Eyre already indicating his affinity for the music and the words associated with the Bronte sisters. And all the while, he was conducting for 15 years the CBS Symphony with two programs, Exploring Music and Invitation to Music. And the guests on the program were the great figures of classical music, composers, performers, and conductors. Bartok, Stravinsky, Villalobos, Mio, Korngold, Hindemith came, as did the harpsichordist Wanda Landowska, Lottie Lehman, the great singer, Claudio Aral, the pianist, Gregor Piatigorsky, one of the world's most famous cellists, and his friend, the acerbic Englishman Sir Thomas Beecham, one of the great wits of music, came as well to conduct. When he was only 14 or 15 years old, Bernard Herrmann discovered the music of Charles Ives in a library, wrote Ives a fan letter, and at a time when a lot of other people thought Ives was just an eccentric, Herrmann became his champion. Mr. Herrmann, when asked about it, he performed works of Ives on radio before anyone else did, said, oh, that was nothing, that's just what one artist does for another. He composed many concert works, which won the admiration of the great conductors of the world, especially Leopold Stokowski, Sir Thomas Beecham, and Sir John Barbaroli. He wrote a violin concerto, a symphony, a sinfonietta, three ballets, and his magnificent cantata, Moby Dick, played by the New York Philharmonic. Mr. Herman described the appeal of Moby Dick. He said it offered a chance to write New England hymns, fiery exhortations and melancholy soliloquies of Captain Ahab, the wild storms of the sea, the drunken revelry of the Pequod's crew, tropical calms and the omnipresent terror of the white whale, a magnificent evocation of ocean, sky, and man grappling with his epic fate. And then there was Wuthering Heights, his masterpiece, his opera, his life's work. It was based, of course, on the novel by Emily Bronte, with a wonderful libretto by Lucille Fletcher, the first Mrs. Bernard Herrmann. 
Lucille Fletcher was an accomplished novelist and radio script writer on her own and the subject of a Mark My Words program. She based the libretto entirely on Bronte's words, and even the arias are based on Bronte's poetry. Mr. Herman called the work a lyric drama. He wrote it in a distinctly English style with wonderful melodies that soared. There was a myth in Hollywood that Bernard Herman was not a melodist, but this is because his idea of a melody was not an Irving Berlin tune. It was a song like Bonsoir by Claude Debussy. Listen to Love is Like the Wild Rose Briar and I've Been Wandering and the other arias in the opera. Wuthering Heights is a magnificent setting of the language and the drama of Emily Bronte. It was a scandal that the work was never performed in his lifetime, although it was recorded under his baton and performed and premiered after his death. His friend Ernest Bean joined him on the moors and discovered what it was like to hear Mr. Herman previewing the work. Bean talked about the wind playing mocking tricks with Mr. Herman's preposterously unmusical voice, providing a preview against a wild setting that the genius of neither Visconti nor Zeffirelli could have improved on. He said it was strange that we've had to rely on a citizen of California to bring to life in the language of music the fierce romantic genius that had its roots in those grim Yorkshire moors. Wuthering Heights was magnificent. We'll talk more about Wuthering Heights and Bernard Herrmann and the amazing genius of this remarkable man right after this message. The Romantic School was mostly influenced by the poetry of the Romantic era. Then later on, painting influenced music a great deal. And at the present time, it's science. I mean, we must uh, keep up with the computer. But uh, it depends what you mean by music. When Beethoven was asked, did he go, you know, what did he feel about being a composer? He denied that he was a composer. He said, no, no, I'm a poet. I'm not a composer, I'm a poet. Read Shakespeare and you'll understand my music. Why do you want to say that for? Bach, I don't know if Bach would have written the music he did without the Bible. Uh, music has always been, in that sense, a catalyst. Uh, it's always been a catalyst. Of course, uh, people like to think that you can substitute other things, and it may or may not be important. It's up to a composer. But a composer like Debussy, all his music is related to visual and uh, literary things uh, and inspiration. Suppose uh, La Mer was known as Sweet for Orchestra. I wonder how often it gets played. Or well, the afternoon of a form was just known as Prelude for Orchestra. Or well, Fiberia was just known as Three Impressions. I think it's a subject that has not been gone into in music uh, at all. And uh, it's one of the great mysteries why it is needed. But uh, one day I think it will be more understood. Uh, I think it's needed if music comes from some place. But if music is only coming from uh, mathematical things, the mathematics is serving the function that poetry used to serve. But I'm not impressed that someone got in the whole tone row in five split seconds, so he's gotten it in in a fraction of a second. Well, I care whether he uses double tone rows or inverts them or plays them upside down. One doesn't admire it. I don't admire it. I don't think it's of any interest. Yes, and with the west wind blowing and bright white clouds drifting rapidly above, and the holy locks that blossoms and blackbirds falling out music on every side and close. 
Bernard Herrmann was a cornucopia of contradictions. He could be as raucous as a taxi horn interrupting a string quartet, but he could write the most tender, ethereal, otherworldly sounds to come from a composer's pen. He was a true scholar with an encyclopedic knowledge of obscure composers and neglected masterpieces. He could bellow with bombast in one moment and calmly quote Shakespeare and Thomas Hardy in the next on par with any Oxford or Cambridge professor. He was a sentimental family man, intensely devoted to animals, especially the stray cocker spaniel he adopted. But he could still thunder at me, if you're a true artist and your family and your relatives get in your way, you walk over them. Do you think I want my epitaph to be Bernard Herrmann was the world's most patient husband? To which Norma added sweetly, don't worry, Benny, no one will ever think that. But there was never a cross word to those who shared his sense of musical integrity, like his friends, the composer Miklas Roja, or the pianist Annette Kaufman and her eminent violinist husband, Louis Kaufman. They joined Mr. Herman prowling through bookstores in his search for English books, artworks, and sometimes even English furniture. He was a lifelong Anglophile. His film scores, of course, were legend. My great favorite, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, which he called his most romantic work. A stunning piece of scoring for Gene Tierney and Rex Harrison in a movie about uh, the love that existed between a ghost and an English widow. And then there was Hangover Square, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. We could do five shows just on the film scores of Bernard Herrmann and his work for television, A Christmas Carol, and his wonderful Christmas opera, A Child is Born. And then there was Walking Distance, an episode of The Twilight Zone, which I regard as the finest single example of television scoring done by anyone ever. His use of strings creates a poignant sense of emotion in depicting Gig Young's memories and his attempt to return to his own childhood in Rod Serling's teleplay. He was associated for many years, of course, with Alfred Hitchcock, they were introduced by their mutual friend, Lynn Murray, and he scored The Trouble with Harry, The Man Who Knew Too Much, in which he appeared conducting The Storm Clouds Cantata, his only on-screen conducting appearance, and Vertigo, in which he took the very idea of being dizzy, of people spinning around in distress, and created that mood musically. And North by Northwest, what a surprise. That was the film that Hitchcock shot with a famous chase sequence on Mount Rushmore, with Cary Grant and Eva Marie Sain and James Mason. As for Mr. Herman, he came up with a symphonic orchestral fandango, amazing, and Psycho, the scariest murder scene ever shot in motion pictures, done with slashing strings only, a black and white sound for a black and white movie, and Marnie, and then came Torn Curtain. And he took the idea of ripping apart the Iron Curtain with 16 horns, 12 flutes, nine trombones, and two tubas, among other things. Hitchcock, under pressure from his bosses at Universal, demanded a score that could be marketed in a pop way to teenagers. He fired Bernard Herrmann in a humiliating way in the middle of a recording session, and the two never spoke again. Mr. Herrmann was told his career was over. Lou Wasserman, the boss of Universal, reflecting the warmth that you can expect from Hollywood executives, said, Benny, come see me when you get hungry. Bernard Herrmann said, Lou, when I get hungry, I go to Chasen's, and out he went. Later, Lionel Newman, head of the music department at 20th Century Fox, told him he wasn't going to be hired because we're running with the kids now. When young European directors discovered the music of Bernard Herrmann, they wanted to hire him, primarily because they wanted to glorify their own films and their own reputations with his genius and his music. When Lionel Newman called him for work, he said, sorry, I'm busy, I'm running with the kids now. What was the Herman style? Well, he did his own orchestrations. He said it was ridiculous for anyone else to use an orchestrator. He said uh, that he would offer $500 to any orchestrator in Hollywood who could orchestrate a prelude from a Wagner opera, Lohengrin, from a sketch. The $500 bet stood throughout his lifetime. No one took him up on it. He said, you can't say, I'll paint the picture, you put in the colors. And look what he did with orchestration in the films that he did with the great stop motion animation master, Ray Harryhausen, the xylophones for the dancing skeletons in The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, and the Celesta for the Lilliputians in The Three Worlds of Gulliver. And in one film, Beneath the Twelve Mile Reef, 
He used nine harps for an underwater sequence with an octopus. Ray Bradbury, the author, was brought to tears by what Bernard Herrmann did with strings in Fahrenheit 451 based on Bradbury's famous book. His last film was Taxi Driver. His harmonic style was also very personal. He loved modal harmonies. He was very drawn to the music of Debussy and particularly to the music of British composers like Delius and Vaughan Williams. He could translate the psychology of a scene into music. He underwrote, he never overwrote. And of course, his music was full of romantic contrasts, not unlike Beethoven, whom he admired. One moment, the music would be incredibly tender and ethereal, and the next moment, you could experience the fury of an ocean storm. He said, don't intellectualize. My colleagues who write a double fugue while two people are having tea are kidding themselves. He resigned his seat in the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, declaring he wanted to be evaluated by his peers, not his inferiors. Hollywood was aghast, but that was Bernard Herrmann. He stood on the side of his musical principles, and he was right. On one occasion, in a recording session, a producer had overdubbed his musical score with some horns with the sound of some barking dogs. Mr. Herrmann demanded that the dog's barking be lowered and the horns be reinstated. The producer refused. He said, you've already been paid, to which Mr. Herman shot back. I haven't cashed the check. What was behind the sound and fury? Uncompromising musical integrity, classic timeless artistic values, and a sincere passion for musical expression. Francois Truffaut, the great French director, told Bernard Herrmann, that other avant-garde composers might give him music for the 20th century, but that Bernard Herrmann would give him music for the 21st. And it's true. Many years after his passing, he remains a legend throughout the world. Would Mr. Herrmann approve of this profile? I suspect not entirely, and I imagine that he would probably give me his opinion in no uncertain terms. Still, we could sum him up by considering the words of the tactless Debussy who impressed young Bartok. A fresh harmony is a bud that blooms on the stem of eternal music. We could say that about the music and the genius of the amazing Bernard Herrmann. On this program, remember, we respect the best of the past that shouldn't be forgotten, the best of the present that shouldn't be ignored, and the best of the future that should never be undiscovered. And this is Mark Evans inviting you to join us again as always and mark my words.